Uh, this is why I never do these first thing in the morning, because <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I think I get better looking as the day goes by. Uh, hello YouTubers, welcome to Big Buddha is watching, I'm Big Buddha. Feeling a little fatigued, this is the seventh video that I've done this week. Uh, it's not going to be a habit, I've just had a few days off work so I thought I'd set by a few days to get a few videos out and there was a lot that I needed to wrap up. I needed to wrap up the Hannibal Lecter Marathon. Obviously Blade Runner 2049 uh, came out this week so I was going to uh, do a couple of videos on them uh, and also a couple of videos on, uh, well, a series that uh, Blade Runner was a very strong influence on which we'll get onto more when I cover Back to Earth Red Dwarf so we're on to season three now this is the uh, series three Red Dwarf three retrospective video um, that, like in my review of series one um, I will also be giving my thoughts on Red Dwarf 12 uh, episode two this time so if you want to just see my thoughts my initial thoughts my initial reaction to Siliconia which I watched last night then skip forward to the last five minutes of the video and I'll just give you my few thoughts on that episode but today I want to look at Red Dwarf 3 uh, which is really the series where the, the it, it can almost be seen as the, the first series in a funny sort of way. The the I guess the series one and two were almost a, a pilot, a, a kind of dry run to see what worked and what didn't. And going into series three, that's where uh, the writers had a much more hands-on approach with the production of the series, and were able to make it much more how they wanted it. How much much more how they originally envisioned it so as I said in the last review there was a pretty dramatic overhaul um, of behind the scenes um, Peter Jackson left this series after the end of series two he, he, he I think he thought he'd finally launched the show and got it running the way um, well he, he got it onto the TV which was his initial uh, his initial intention um, and, um, you know, famously, he, he's kind of a difficult character to work with. So, um, so Rob and Doug, from this point on, they took over as producers of the series. They retained Ed Bayes, a, a pretty solid um, sitcom director, uh, comedy director, and directed at least some of the best comedy that was on TV in the 90s, uh, if you ask me. Um there was, uh, uh, as well as him, uh, they um, retaining over. Obviously, all the cast stayed, but there was additions this time. They brought the character Crichton back. Uh, original intention was for David Ross, who played him in series two, to carry on, but he was um, he didn't turn down the role. But he he couldn't do the dates because he was still uh, I think he was doing a play at the time so they recast with another stalwart of the stand-up comedy scene Robert Llewellyn who I think believe got the job because he'd done a show in Edinburgh called uh, something along the lines of I am robot born a woman or something where he 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 was a, originally a, a member of the sketch show Troop the Joeys but he'd done this little play in which he played an android and obviously someone at the BBC, I, I forget who, it might have been Robert Doug actually, um, had seen this play and thought, um, I just really liked his manner as a uh, an android character. So he got the role. Um, he he had a little trouble finding the character at first. You know, he, he doesn't play it in the same vein as David Ross, who very much played it as a, the fussy English butler. Um, he... I think he, he, Llewellyn's original take on the character was something more akin to that and th there is actually, I think it's a deleted scene on on this disc where um, he, you see a, a very early incarnation, a very early attempt by Llewellyn to emulate 
uh, Davy Ross's performance and play him in the more fussy English butler uh, style. Um, that they felt like that didn't really work. It just wasn't funny. So they tried a few other things, doing it in a Swedish accent, uh, and eventually Llewellyn arrived on the idea of doing it uh, as a Canadian. I think he he had had an ex girlfriend who was Canadian, so did it his take on a Canadian accent. Uh, he's he says he's since learned that it's not really a Canadian accent. No one really talks like that in Canada, but it's uh, that that's uh, behind the the Crichton voices. Uh, a kind of botched attempt at a Canadian accent by an English stand up comic. Um, so, you know, um, a, bi a big addition to the cast and obviously the addition of the Crichton character, uh, although he was really, in series three at least, he was really just there to uh, make further jokes about, um, about mopping the floor and be being a subservient slave to the crew and then uh, treating him really badly, uh, something that will link into Siliconia actually. Um, the, over time, the Crichton character really started to supersede Holly, which led to the decision after Series 5 to actually get rid of the Holly character. Because whereas in Series 1 and 2, Holly was great for exposition, he was great for setting up the plot. Um, by Series 5, at least, you can see... Or Series 4, you can see that Crichton and Holly are really sharing lines. They kind of half the exposition between the two of them. Um, and that really led to the conclusion... By Series 5, you know, Holly's really only getting one token line an episode, so mm. she she was kind of deemed a necessary character after Season 5, sadly. Um, so that that was the, the, the sort of long-term change of introducing a, a fourth character, a fourth member of the crew. Um, Holly, as well as of course, is um, change has a, a sex change um, over this between series two and three. Uh, as I said in the last review, he, he um, Norman Lovett decided he didn't want to make the show anymore. He, he'd done two seasons and he, he felt that that was enough and uh, it was too far for him to commute. Although um, apparently there was some um, condemnation on his part that they'd recast. He thought that they would just get rid of the character and um, and, and keep the, the character there should he ever want to return. But... And I think he was slightly grieved at the, at the fact that he just thought that Hattie Hatridge was just doing his act. I have to say, you know, someone who started watching the show avidly from season four onwards, uh, Hattie Hatridge has always been my Holly, my, my preferred Holly. Love Norman, love it, sure. Um, met him, you know, he's, um, he's, he's a really nice guy in, in real life. Uh, but he... Um, but Hattie Hatridge was always my Holly, and um, I'd love to see her return. But of course, the the, um, the big uh, change in the series came with the look. They got set designer Mel Bibby in, um, and he produced something that was uh, a look to the series that was a complete 180 from the very dull looking submarine what was supposed to be a submarine inspired set but didn't even look much like a submarine just looked like some cardboard sets um mel bibby gave the the film a very film inspired look a very ridley scott inspired look actually uh the the sleeping quarters took on the look of deckard's apartment in um in Blade Runner and um, and of course the when they they go out into the ships you, and the corridors all have a very alien s sort of look to them and apparently achieved very economically achieved on a budget of you, you know um, having light light shining through painted palettes to look like uh, something that in Robert Llewellyn's words was mind on titanium by out of titanium on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was the the big um, change there. The the other big change, of course, was they they went for um, a different look with the costumes. I I keep forgetting to check the name um, of the the woman who who did the costumes because. Um, uh, 
I'm gonna. I'll. I'll. I'll, I'll try and. Um, I'll. I'll get a name, and um, give her a shout out in the, in the next video because she's been a major part of. If it was it a woman or a man? I don't know. I'll. I'll fact check that uh, and put that right in uh, my review of season four, um, because the, the, uh, the, the costumes really cemented a big part of the, the characters, you know, and really made them um stand out and distinctive um the, the um the, craig charles has said that the, the great thing about um the, the characters in red dwarf is that you can recognize them in silhouette they're almost like cartoon characters in in that respect and that's a large part down to uh, the costume design you know lister um the Hawaiian shirts went and in his place he got a more biker look um, with leathers and um, he was given a leather jacket and the, the, the costume designer, um, Howard Burden, is that, that might be his name. I was thinking it's a woman actually, but I think I, think I might be making, uh, mixing her up with the makeup woman actually. Yeah, I think it's Howard Burden who, yeah, Howard Goodall did the music, Howard Burden did the costumes. Yes, okay, there, there you go. Um, so he, um, they gave him a, a leather jacket that they thought and they thought with his art school background, even though he was only there for 17 minutes, um, he, he sort of um, designed it himself, you know, um, drew pictures and um, sewed on bits and pieces that he just found. Um, of course, um, Rimmer got a more Captain Scarlet sort of look. Um, but the, the hat sort of really bit the dust after the the, the, the this season. Um, but initially, the, the idea was Captain Scarlet or Captain Emerald, as they, they may, do make a joke it, it, in the series. Um, the cats get gets uh, a much more varied wardrobe, you know. In, in seasons one and two, it's really just sharp zoot suits that he wears. And of course, Crichton um, gets a more roboty looking suit as, as opposed to the PVC outfit that David Ross had to endure. Oh, and of course the um, the look of the H is uh, is much better. They didn't quite perfect it until season five, uh, which is um, uh, where they went for a slightly different font. But having it as a, uh, as a less as a bulky metallic thing and, and more as a well a hologram looking H um, just looks a lot better, more subtle, and, and really ties into the the look of the entire show. So. You know, although it's uh, it still looks a bit ropey because it is nineteen eighty nine, so it's 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 still, but it it was still leaps and bounds ahead, and I really admire the the, the way that it's leaps and bounds ahead of what they did in series one and two, and uh, I really admire the look that they managed to achieve with um, uh, you know on a minuscule budget. It's um, it, it, there is a, a level of sophistication that was way ahead of what doc, even what Doctor Who was doing at, at the time, um, and and various other BBC produced science fiction. I think this is the I, I'd say this was the best looking science fiction show at the time that the BBC had ever produced. You know, um, over hitchhikers and and everything that that they'd done to that point space cops <laughs> um so let's let's uh, quickly go through the episodes uh I've, backwards i've touched on before um i, I forget why but uh, it, uh yeah yeah the 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 crew go through a time hole uh, end up back on earth something else that happens that seems to happen a lot is um the, the, the crew seem to end up back on earth a lot um it puts it really in recent series it, um you've got to ask the question why because the, they seem to pretty much have the ability to go back to earth whenever they want because they've got the time drive now so why are they still on the ship uh, trying to get back to earth when uh, they, they could go to earth at any time but uh, you know there's probably some back to the futuresque explanation about them uh, interfering with the timelines too much um so, but sorry, anyway, so the yeah, they, they finally end up back on Earth, but it's um, Earth where time's running backwards. And um, lot, uh, I mean, the the big standout scene in this is a, a barroom brawl, uh, but done in reverse, um, which is it's such fun to watch, unrumble. Uh, Marooned is, um, 
it, it, it's regarded as a classic and it is a, a, a kind of a very funny episode there's some great lines you know um if are you trying to say i've got a big bum big it's like two badly parked Volkswagens uh really funny anecdotes um you know it's the basic plot is just Rimmer and List uh, they've they've crashed on Starbug and uh, on a nice planet and they're they're waiting for help and they talk to each other uh so you, you get some um character mo great character moments the story of how Lister and Rimmer both lost their virginities um Lister having to eat dog food to survive um it's uh, again I mean when I was younger I, I I, it wasn't a favourite episode because uh, of the lack of science fiction. I, I just thought nothing happened in it. But uh, as I've got older, it's it's an episode I've come to really, really appreciate um, just b because of the... Um, just because of the pathos of, of it. And, and there's some really... There's great jokes and great anecdotes, and it's a fine... If you look at it as a sitcom, it's a fine half hour of comedy. Um, just, um, I, I briefly I've got to mention also the the big main... One of the other big main additions to this series is Starbug, which makes its first appearance in Red Dwarf. It doesn't appear at all in series one and two. Uh, again, I guess, put... Um, putting paid to the, the parallel universe theory. But uh, in series two, the transport craft was Blue Midget, who, which does still briefly make an appearance uh, throughout the series when Starbug is he's not available for every reason. But Starbug certainly became the, um, the craft of choice for the crew, even to the point of it becoming entirely set on Starbug in seasons one and six you know uh, for a show called Red Dwarf it wasn't actually set on on the ship Red Dwarf throughout seasons one and two uh, throughout seasons six and seven sorry because they were spending so much time on, on Starbug uh, they thought they better do the whole show there um, so see, uh, episode three is Polymorph and this uh, as well as the alien inspired look this is uh, really their attempt to do well to do alien you know it is alien but um alien with that extra added element of imagination this is also the first appearance of of a gelf um a, a genetically engineered life form which was really their get out uh, the writers get out from of doing uh, because they'd written this rule that they couldn't have aliens, but then they decided to have genetically engineered life forms, life forms that were uh, engineered by humans appear throughout the series, which essentially became the aliens of Red Dwarf. But uh, I believe to date, no, technically no aliens have appeared in Red Dwarf as of yet. Um, so it's it's the alien monster, but um, instead of killing you, it sucks out your emotions. So so you get this um, added element where the, the cast are able to portray their characters uh, uh, a different side to their characters, you know. Lister loses his fear, so he becomes a bit of a psycho. Rimmer loses his his. Um, uh, what does Rimmer lose? I forget, but he becomes kind of a liberal, wet hippie almost character. Um, Crichton loses his guilt, so um, he, he just be starts being rude to everyone. Cat loses his vanity, so he uh, essentially becomes a slob. Uh, uh, oh yeah, Rumor loses his anger. That that's it because um, the Gelf can shape shift as well, so he, he can appear as characters and uh, and uh, he appears as Rimmer's mother and um, says he's just had sex with Lister, which makes him very very angry. Um, yeah, uh, maybe a good a solid episode, but uh, maybe not one of my. It was never really one of my favourites. I thought it was slightly overrated, but uh, it was um, it was strong enough to get a, an actual sequel episode in in CV six. So um, in, in the guise of emo hawk. Um, after that, you get no. It, it's difficult because they swap these episodes around on the on the VHS releases. So I believe. It's time slides next, or is it body swap? 
well, whatever. Okay, well, well time slides is um, is a fun little episode. They um, Crichton is developing some pictures and slides because that's something we're going to be doing in the future. Um, but the developing fluid fluid is, has mutated over three million years, which means that the photos become windows into the past. They they actually come to life. So when they um, they develop the slides as well. Yeah, <laughs> futuristic technology. I'm sure we're going to have slides in the the 23rd century. Um, when, when he develops the slides, they actually become windows into the past, and then Lister realizes he could go back into the past and change his destiny. So he doesn't wind up on Red Dwarf. He he gives him an invention called the Tension Sheet, which is a very very fun little idea that somebody would market. Uh, bubble wrap um, uh, as a tension sheet for people to pop and this makes the, the person that invents it the, a multi multi millionaire even though it's uh, such a simple idea he gives it to his younger self who's actually played by his own brother Emil Charles uh, and oh yeah this is it. the first appear appearance of um, of Emil Charles, he's he's in his band Smeg and the Heads, and he's singing the Om song. One of the first uh, references to Lister have um, having aspirations to be a musician, and and the Om song, this awful droney song that he, he's invented. Um, of course, um, he rewrites the timelines, and then Rimmer is left alone. Um, on the ship, and then he decides to go back and give himself the the tension sheet. Um, but his plan backfires and doesn't work. This is um, notable for a very, very funny ending where a list, a Rimmer essentially comes back to life at the end because he, he's done something to the timelines, which means he's alive, uh, and then gets killed off straight away afterwards because he has no luck. A very funny episode. Um, Body Swap is another solid episode as well, one I really enjoy. Um, noteworthy because it was such a high concept episode. It essentially, Rimmer and Lister swap bodies and um, get a chance to play each other. And um, but just in the the physicality. That so Chris Barry has. Um, Craig Charles's voice dubbed over his and vice versa and uh, because it was such um, a technically different difficult episode to make that it's the first one they actually pre-recorded this became the norm for series 7 but series 7 alone to just do pre-records and then play the episodes to <coughs> an audience later um yeah very very fun very uh, solid little episode and um and then episode six is the last day. Like series two, you got two, and, and series one actually, um, you, you got two, four very sci fi episodes in this series and two character episodes. Like the last day would be, a, I, I put it into a, a character, um, a more of a character study episode. It's about a replacement droid coming to replace Crichton and uh, the boys giving uh, Crichton a send-off before Hudson 10, the uh, played by one of the many absolutely stalwarts in the series, Gordon Kennedy, turns up. So, you, you know, not not a great display of imaginative conceptual sci-fi stuff in in this one it's um you know it's very much just the killer android turning up and them having to defeat him at the end but the the, the party scene is a lot of fun and um you know more anecdotes for um from the the characters and um you know fun seeing them get drunk and, and lots of drunk jokes you know even holly gets drunk and, and Crichton as well uh not not quite on as a character study episode not quite on the level of marooned uh, but more all-encompassing you know good to see a character episode where the the whole cast is included not just barry and charles so uh yeah season three it's it's a great season this is really vintage red dwarf you know if, if i was it, you know, if you wanted to see, if you were new to Dwarf and wanted to see what all the fuss is about, I'd I'd recommend season three, but uh, season three and four are really I think the quintessential versions of Dwarf, and 
you know, arguably the, the uh, conceptually that's what they're still trying to emulate to the this the, the this is really the uh, the golden era of Red Dwarf and um, uh, you know the, the the stuff in it that sticks in the memory because I I remember getting home from uh, from the Cub Scouts every Wednesday I think when it was on and just I would always catch the last ten minutes of the episode and think what is this program it's uh, it looks so bizarre. <laughs> It is it is a bizarre show if you if you just catch the last ten minutes of Red Dwarf every time, um, because if you catch the last ten minutes of Siliconia, which is the the show I watched last night, episode two of series twelve, um, yeah, I mean, you'd have come into the middle of um, Crichton having a, a mop fight with Lister, who's now mysteriously turned into a mechanoid. So I was right, you know, Siliconia was the the episode where the the whole crew got mechanized. Um, this really is um, indicative of a problem that's sort of emerged really since uh, after Rob Grant left, which is Doug Naylor recycling old ideas or or doing variations of old ideas. You know, I think as a concept, although it, the you know the big draw of this episode and it is a lot of fun to see the the cast get turned into mechanoids. It is essentially just him taking DNA the the episode from <clears throat> I think it's episode two from series four and flipping the idea. There you had uh, there was a chance for Robert Llewellyn to be humanized so, so you know you, you could see what he looks like without the makeup here you get a chance to see the rest of the cast look what they look like in the mechanoid makeup and uh, uh although um you know the odd i find it an odd decision why did they give the i mean because the the, the the plot of the story is that um they come into contact with uh, a bunch of other mechanoids, sort of militant mechanoids who, who call themselves the Militia of Intergalactic uh, Li Liberation Front. No, 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 the Mechanoid Intergalactic Liberation Front, that's right, or MILS for short. Doug Naylor just loves a, a, an acronym. Um, so yeah, and um, they they tr take out um, the crew's brains and stick them into mechanoids, um, and so it, the, you know that's the fun ep aspect of the the show is to see the, the how the uh, Lister Rimmer and Cat act as mechanoids, and then s slowly their personalities start to um, get turned more Crichton esque. So this was really because. It, because you know, way back when Chris Barry did the audio books, you know, he did impressions of all the cast, and he can do Robert Llewellyn brilliantly. He can do Crichton brilliantly. So this was really a, a, a chance to play Robert Llewellyn for for Chris Barry, and um, you know, he, he does it with a plum here. Um, I, I, actually, Craig Charles and Danny John Jules, they they approach it for more actually point you know rather than doing a straight up impression but their their version is more subtle but the over the episode the um their body language becomes and their speech patterns become much more akin to robert llewellyn's rather than than doing a, a flat out impression so they're um so all the, the cast are pretty good in this episode um but you know as i said it, recycling old ideas we're we're, we're two we're really to a stage now where um, we're really cycling old jokes as well. You know, the first joke in this is um, Cat making a reference to his six nipples again. Um, uh, yeah, Lister's guitar makes a, a reappearance in this, you know, so there's more jokes again from Rimmer about how he, much he hates the guitar and how much he hates the Oms song. Uh, and how, how he wants to have his ears removed, you know. Uh, sadly, recycling old the uh, ideas. Um, the, but as an episode, uh, the first two thirds were a little engaging. It, it fell flat a little to me, for me towards the end. I didn't think the gladiatorial mop fights really well shot and, and a good looking scene looks like something out of Escape from New York but just it wasn't that funny really um, 
I put what so is Siliconia real? Because I, I, I've watched the episode twice now. Um, I, I was mistakenly thinking that Siliconia was the equivalent was the same thing as Silicon Heaven. I thought wasn't it called Silicon Heaven before? I, I think, um, but now Siliconia is something different. Siliconia is just like a basically a Nirvana state for for mechanoids that they want to achieve, which and it does make an appearance towards the end of the episode. So Siliconia, not technically Silicon Heaven. So not not um not as strong as last week's episodes, sadly. But uh, you know, so there were, there are some f fun things to behold in this episode. The, notably, the cast getting turned into mechanoids, and uh, I, I really want to see the um, behind the scenes documentary on this series now because I, I suspect. You know, one of, one of the uh, main gripes is that Doug Naylor comes up with these concepts that, uh, that he knows that the, the cast are just going to uh, have a really difficult time doing. And I know that um, there's going to be a lot of bitching and moaning about from the cast, uh, it, all in good manner, uh, about having to be turned into mechanoids. So um, that's going to be fun to see. Um, so there you go, folks. That's my... Thoughts on Red Dwarf 3, Strong Series, Siliconia, um, not, no, no classic by any stretch of the imagination, but, um, you know, um, yes, I mean, seeing, seeing the um, cast as mechanoids was a lot of fun. Um, so I'm going to sign off now, folks. Last video of the week. I'm, I'm going to go back to doing the, the normal two a week for, for the next few weeks, unless there's something I really need to to get out there. But it's it's um, I'm going to plow on now with just doing the rest of Red Dwarf series by series for the next few weeks. So uh, if you like Red Dwarf, great. If you, if you don't, it's not going to be for you. Uh, but until then, folks, join me for my thoughts on Red Dwarf 4, and um, I shall see everyone out there in YouTube land.